It all started when we saw the film What the Bleep Do We Know? We are members of the World Academy of Kabbalah, headed by Rav Michael Leitman. Having seen the film, we were surprised at how close modern science has come to confirming the Kabbalistic view of the universe. Scientists specializing in quantum physics have discovered on their own the depth of matter described by Kabbalists more than 3,000 years ago, and we decided to go meet with them. We arrived in San Francisco in March 2005. What did we expect from the meeting? We wanted to be heard. The people in the audience were mostly young students who had come to meet their favorite scientists. The film was a hit in North and South America, Europe and Japan. It had collected more than $10 million in box office revenue by that time. More than 420,000 DVDs had been ordered the previous month. It started out as a regular scientific conference. Scientists approached the podium and began to speak about the science to which they had devoted their entire lives, about the film that had turned them into stars. Um, I gather pretty much everybody here saw the film. Is that a fair, fair assessment? So I don't have to review anything in it. In exotic physics, there is a higher electromagnetic gauge symmetry state than our normal environment, which is called the SU2 state. And at that state, electric and magnetic monopoles are naturally supposed to coexist. Our next speaker is Dr. Wolf. And then Dr. Wolf approached the podium. No one had anticipated what was about to unfold. He didn't say a word about his own science. I really don't know what I'm going to say to you. You know, I had been studying physics, and I knew something about that technology, but Kabbalah as a science was something that never would have even dawned on me. I don't care what you're doing. There is something about this field of way of thinking, of seeing, which can improve anything. And I don't care if you're a Jew, a Muslim, Gentile, Arab, I don't care what you are. I don't care what nationality. I don't care what religion you belong to. There's something in this that will, I think, awaken something in you. In order and to understand what had happened, we need to go back to the previous day, to his one-on-one -on -one with Rav. Unfortunately, we didn't start shooting from the beginning. But Wolf's question was how to stop endless conflicts all over the world. The soul consists of three lines, middle, left, and right. All the conflicts in the world are over who controls the middle line. There is no use trying to settle these conflicts on our level. We have to rise along the middle line. The two lines on the sides are long, containing ten spheres. The middle line is short. It begins above the lower third of the other two lines. The left and the right lines are connected to the middle line and provided with their lower thirds and that causes all the conflicts, pain and suffering in the world. We need to disengage from this lower third and rise up to our own part, which are the vessels of the store. We can accomplish this only with the help of the upper light, the light of Kabbalah, the light that surrounds our souls, that enhances our vessels of bestowal and it makes them stronger than the lower third. If we can transform ourselves this way, the same process will take place in all of humanity, in the billions of people that live today. I will give you the uh, introduction to the book of Zohar today. This process is described there, starting from item 60. It tells us how we can change the entire world through inner transformation, because each person has a small world within him. When people study Kabbalah, it gets them because suddenly certain truths about what is going on, what is this happening, begin to become clearer, clearer than they were before. And suddenly you begin to see whatever it is that you're working on, whatever it is that you think is the most important thing in the world, begins to kind of dissipate into something less of less importance and you begin to see a bigger picture of what's going on. 
Kabbalah will help liberate your mind from any shackles of thought that keep you ensconced or enclosed into a certain way of thinking. Now, if these words are awakening you right now, you know it. If they're not awakening you right now, then I'm suggesting to you that you've fallen asleep. <laughs> Thank you. We agreed to meet later that day behind closed doors. We drove along the streets of San Francisco and shared our impression of the past day. We were preparing for the day to come. We knew from personal experience the effect that Kabbalah has by repeating the same question day after day, that they no longer come from the mind, they come from the heart. One begins to search for the middle line that Rav had described, the middle line within, and it's not easy. And so it happened. Barry, the American writer, wanted to start the discussion smoothly by the book, but instead he was confronted by Dr. Wolf's fiery personality. I'm just this, so I'd like to stop you for a minute and just, uh, uh, are you a practitioner of this observings of the six or more senses? Can you talk about your experiences in that world? I would like to learn from you what you're talking about, otherwise it's just all gas. No. No. He want to because he doesn't have the same sense and the same reminiscence. You can't just throw that at me and say, accept it, this is the way it is, I'm Kabbalah, that's what it teaches you, and if you just do this, you'll be, you know, I'm not, that's bullshit to me, I'm not going to accept that. Can I answer this? So please allow him to talk. And sure. The wisdom of Kabbalah states that reality is only a will to receive for self-fulfillment. That desire is built through expansion of the upper light. Light is giving, bestowal love. We call it creator. It created something called a clear vessel, or a desire to enjoy, which wants to be fulfilled by precisely what is in the light. And then Rav began to describe four phases of the upper light. If the creature receives pleasure, the creator enjoys. If the creature doesn't enjoy, the creator does not enjoy. We must give full credit to the scientists. They sat, listened, took notes, and began to understand. The fact that they were open was a testimony to them being genuine scientists. Then, Dr. Wolf raised another question. You laid it out beautifully, but I want to understand better. Just so if I may, see if I understand this right. One, there is a creator who desires to give. Mm -hmm. Yes? yes? Ken? Okay. So who ever gives man. to a what dummy? A, okay. a dummy. It's just a, it's a, a golem. Mm -hmm. Gives to a golem. Yes. Okay. No. That's what I said. Right? Okay. No. Now, the next thing, from two to three, what no. happens there? In state two, it begins to feel the giver itself. It's nature. In stage two, the golem is coming alive. Is that what's happening? And everybody joined in the discussion. It requires a threshold As it does. Of, of light. Dr. William Tiller. To spontaneously generate consciousness. Entrance of the light and its departure builds these impressions, these vibrations in the clean, the consciousness. Dr. Jeffrey Satanova. As it turned out, this was not his first encounter with Kabbalah. The Ramchal talks about uh, the world having a deterministic and an indeterministic component. And also about um, some, some human beings just um, having no place whatsoever. I'm referencing that from his book, um, Dera Hashem. Ramchal was one of the greatest Kabbalists. Ramchal taught Kabbalah. He was thrown out of his city. He was boycotted. Derech Hashem, the path of God, is a path of ten sefirot. The entire spiritual ladder is divided into ten parts. Even the first part in this ladder is already above the barrier. A tornado swept over San Francisco that evening. 